Eric, you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry, I have a hardware mute button as well, <laughs> which doubles up. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Nomad release 0 0.12 webinar. Now there have been a huge number of features released in that release, but we're only going to be looking at a few of them. And some of those might be the ones that haven't been highlighted as much yet. So it's a, a good time to take a look at those. Now, if we look at the, the list, there have been some, some networking features that were added. There are some, some UI features that were added and uh, some drivers and scheduling things that are now possible with Nomad. Now we're going to start off by taking a look at some of the new featuring uh, scheduling features and changes. Now, one of the features that has come over from the enterprise edition is that you can now use preemption in Nomad open source. And I will show that through a little demo. So let me pop open my remote machine. Now we're gonna go jump over in the Nomad preemption. And I'm going to be spinning up a very simple Nomad cluster with some client configuration um, and server configuration. Now, the only change I have to make to my Nomad servers is I need to set which of these schedulers can use the preemption, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm changing the default schedule config and I'm saying that the service system and batch schedulers can all make use of preemption. So what that means is if I have a job that has a higher priority, it will get scheduled even though there might not be place to schedule. So how I'm going to simulate that is I, I've set a maximum limit of two gigs on my machine that Nomad can use. I've set about 20% to be reserved, right? So if we take a look at the Nomad UI, which is not running on localhost, but I'm running on grab the IP. There we go. So we have our Nomad cluster, and I'm just running one node to simulate this. But you can see that I only have two gigs of memory available for my jobs. Now, I'm not running any jobs right now, so there shouldn't be any problems scheduling these jobs. So let me run the first job. And I'm gonna run a job with a low priority. Now, if we take a look at this job, there's nothing special here. It's just type service, it's running a Docker container, and it's using about one gigabyte of memory. And the important part here is that it has a priority of 50, right? So that means it's an average priority because priority can range from one to 100, and this is average. average. Now, I have another job that is very important and it needs to run, um, but there might not be space on my cluster when I run it. Because if I take a look at my Nomad cluster, this job is running and it has more than a gig reserved. So that means that including the um, reserved memory that Nomad is using to keep on the client, I will not have enough space to schedule this high priority job. Now, if I would change the priority of the high priority job to say 10, and I will try to run it, Oh, it actually has extra space. So let me just to uh, make this a bit more obvious, make this memory a bit higher. <laughs> uh, interesting. Well, I think I just found a bug um, because it should have actually not scheduled the um, the job until the priority was actually higher. Uh, Tim, if I did something wrong and you want to chime in, let me know. But uh, I hadn't encountered, encountered that one before. But as we can see, 
the low job is actually placed in pending. It got stopped. And then the high job got actually run. Oh, uh, I know why it went wrong. And that is because I made a change to a file on my local machine and not here. So let's try that again. If I try to do a nomad run on the high job, but I change it, it first all right so let's change this to 10 all right let's stop the high job okay why again we now see that the low job is directly running again if we now try to submit the high job we actually see that memory is exhausted. So that's the correct behavior. So now if we change it again, but we actually change it to have a higher priority than the other job, even 60 or 55 would be enough. And we try to submit it again. We see that the scheduling now actually performs correctly as we expected. The low job gets queued and the high priority job then can do what it needs to do. So this way, you can always be sure that even if you're running batch jobs that are doing some processing in the background, but are not that vital, you can always have enough instances of your jobs running that are actually vital. So another thing that I would like to highlight that is now possible in Nomad is you can change the default scheduling behavior. By default, Nomad tends to bin pack services that it's running. Um, that means that it's basically playing Tetris with your service and it tries to pack them as efficiently as possible to make the most out of the resources that are available on each of the nodes. Right? So it'll try to fill up one server first and then start to use other service when needed. Now, for some companies that might not be the ideal situation, because say for instance, you have a lot of hardware in your data centers and you're running them anyway, and you're paying for them anyway, you might want to spread out your load over all of those machines. Now, it is now possible to change that behavior. So let's destroy this one. So let's start off with a simple bin packing example. Right. This will take slightly longer because we're actually spinning up a server and three nodes this time. And I'm going to be running three applications. So if we take a look here, my nomad config is very minimal. I just have a very simple server config here and I'm running three nodes, right? Now the applications that I'll be running are just three simple containers one is called API, one is called backend, and then one is called cache, right? And they are separate jobs, which means that they do not have to be scheduled together on the nodes. All right, so the Nomad cluster that we're running, let's take a look at Nomad UI. So we have no jobs running, but we have our three nodes up. Now let's start scheduling these three applications. So let's do nomad run, jobs, and let's run A. So we can see that when we run this, A actually gets deployed on this node, A42. Now, if we run B, we see that it does get placed on a different node, but it should put most of the jobs on the same machine. So what it did is it did come up with 36E for both B and C, right? And if I would try nomad stop uh, API, and if we would run that again, we actually do see that this time it did get placed on that same node. And 
Sometimes Nomad does place things on a different node, and that's because the scheduler tries to be optimistic when placing things. So if it finds a fit, it'll try to do that, but it'll try to be as optimized as possible with the resources. Now, if we take a look in the clients, we can see that it was the 3.6a uh, node that had all the applications scheduled. And we see here that API, cache, and backend are all placed on the same machine. Right. So that's bin packing in action. Now, let's see what would happen if we actually use the spread. OK. Start this up. Now, if we take a look at the configuration that we have in Nomad, there's only one change that we've made. We've only added the default scheduler algorithm um, for Nomad and changed it to spread, right? So that means that it's now using the spread scheduler instead of the bin packing scheduler. And you can only use one of the two um, when you bootstrap your cluster because they tend to not work well together as one tries to put everything in one place and the other one then tries to spread it. So let's wait for this to be running. And if we take a look at the applications, they're exactly the same. I have API with a count of one, B backend with a count of one, and then cache with a count of one. All right. So if we again try to schedule these jobs, I can just do nomad run. Let's do A first. So this got placed on E4. If we do B, we see that it gets placed on 39E. And C gets placed on B89. So of our three nodes, there were three different, oh, let me refresh that three different clients that were used. So Nomad is trying to spread it as evenly as possible and try to spread them, out, uh, spread them out as much as it can. So in this case, if one of the nodes goes down and it is like say the node that would have been the initial one in the bin packing situation, we now only lose one of the applications and it'll get rescheduled, which means that there's a lot less moving around. So in the case that you already do have all that hardware, that's a very nice way to actually utilize it. Okay. Let's take this one down. So there are also some of the UI features that I would like to highlight, um, which can be very, very nice if you're using the UI very often. Now, a very important one is the global search. So you can now actually search for jobs, allocations, clients, et cetera, just by using the search field. If you use a slash, you would get the search field, and then you can type the search query, and you can then, at the top of the screen, filter for jobs. I will show that in, in action later when I do one of the other demos. Now, another important one is monitor. Sometimes uh, the Nomad server doesn't start correctly or doesn't load the drivers that you want or something happens while scheduling. Instead of having to go through your logs, you can now go into the monitor tab of your clients and servers to actually check out what has happened with the certain job or driver and find out the error messages there. So we'll also take a look at that in a second. And finally, if your job has the scaling stanza that is also used for the Nomad Auto Scaler, you can now scale your jobs from the UI itself. So if you um, want to scale up one extra instance, you can now just do so by changing the number at the top of the screen or hitting plus or minus. So let's take a look at that. Spin up a little cluster for us. Right. Okay. 
So we're not running any jobs right now, but we want to run one that has scaling stanza. So in this API job, I have actually added scaling stanza. Now, if you are familiar with the Nomad Autoscaler, you might be thinking that I'm missing some fields. And that is true because normally you would have a scaling policy here that would contain the strategy and the query, et cetera. But to just arbitrarily scale from the UI, you don't even need those, right? I just want to enable scaling and then have a minimum and maximum values. And then Nomad will actually keep them within those values. So if we run this job, we will now see that in the UI, we have our job again. And we see here that we have to wait a second because Nomad is still deploying the application. But now that we have it, we can actually start scaling the allocation. So we can either do that from the job directly by hitting the plus here, or if we want to set it to a specific value directly, we can do that here. So currently we're running one instance of the API. Now, if I change that to three, we will see that Nomad is now adding two instances. And while it's doing the deployment, it will prevent you from changing the values again. Right. So the blue has left, so it is done with the deployment. Um, say for instance, we want to scale down to two. It's just as easy as hitting the minus button. Right. So this is really nice. Now, let's say we want to search for our jobs and we have a huge list of them, which in this case, we might not. We can actually search here for jobs, clients. So here we can see our client. We can say, I want just API, all right? Or I think you can even do regex type things with uh, stars or wildcards, et cetera. So this is very useful if you need to drill down into what you're searching for. Now, for instance, to take a look at maybe some of the scheduling decisions that were made, let's take a look at the Nomad client here. I'm going to open it in a second tab so we can actually take a look at all the decisions going on while it's happening. And let's start scaling our application a bit. Right, so let's scale that up. Right, Nomad is taking action here. As we can see, we can see our queries going on here. We can see member list information. We can see the new evaluation happening. So this is a very nice way to quickly check out what is happening in your cluster. Say for instance, why is my job not getting deployed? Uh, this is a great way to do that. Let's quickly open up the presenter view again. Right. Go through that because I hit the mouse button. Okay, so job scaling. Now another very nice feature that we added is some improvements for operators. Um, I'm sure you've all had scenarios where you accidentally took down your Nomad cluster and you wanted to restore the state it was in, right? You you want all the jobs that were there previously to be launched again. Well, now that's actually possible because you can take a snapshot of your Nomad cluster and then restore it afterwards. So let's try this and let's take a look at that. So I'm going to split up a cluster. And again, I'm just going to spin up a simple single node cluster. And I'm just going to be running my simple API job again, right? Um, I have no special configuration on my Nomad cluster. 
So I don't need to define anything to make use of this. It'll work on any cluster. Now, if we go to the UI, we can see that I don't have anything running right now. So to do a backup right now would not make a lot of sense. So let's start running that job. Right. So our job is running, everything is good. We have the state that we want. Let's make a backup of this. So in case something does go wrong, we don't have to worry, right? So we can do nomad operator snapshot save and let's call it backup.snap right so we now have a local file here called backup.snap now if i taint this nomad node my my tool shipyard will actually try and recreate it so if we actually do a shipyard run now we will see that it's actually destroying the nomad cluster and then recreating it, wiping out our entire state. So if this was production, we would have a problem, right? We accidentally took down the servers and all the clients. So there's no state, no jobs, nothing. But luckily we were smart enough to make a backup before. So, Let's restore that. And if we go back, we can actually see that we have our API running again. Now the state has been restored, but it's not actually running all the jobs yet because it first has to figure out that the nodes that we put back into its state are not no longer there yet, right? So if we take a look inside the uh, server, this is the R1, we can see that we don't currently have a job running. And that's because it's not actually detected that it's unhealthy yet. So the state actually has to converge and realize that that node is now lost. Now this takes a few minutes. So while we wait for that, I'd actually like to head over to another scheduling feature that we will showcase. So. We already had multi-cluster visibility in, in Nomad, where you could query other regions uh, for their, their jobs, or you could submit a job to a certain region. But now you can actually deploy a job simultaneously to multiple different clusters. And to showcase that, I'd like to uh, welcome on video my colleague, Tim Gross, and to show us that. Let me hand it over to you, Tim. Thanks. All right, let me just share here. Okay, so is that what was the window? Okay, so uh, my name is Tim Gross. I'm an engineer on the Nomad team. Um, before we can really talk about uh, multi cluster deployments, uh, I want to talk, we want, need to know a little bit about how and why we federate Nomad clusters to begin with. So each Nomad cluster has a group of servers and a group of clients. The clients are where you run your workloads. So that's your application, whether it's Docker or Podman, Java, exec, whatever. Uh, a cluster can have many clients. In fact, there are nomad clusters with thousands of client nodes. The servers are the brains of the cluster. No matter how big each cluster has between three and seven servers. Uh, and these servers have to agree on what job to run on the clients. And they come to an agreement with on those scheduling decisions with an algorithm called Raft. Uh, you might have heard of that, and that's used. That's the same algorithm that uh, Console and Vault use in their servers to agree on decisions. Nomad servers in a Raft cluster need to be pretty close together. Otherwise, Raft gets very slow, and the cluster can't make decisions uh, within about 10 milliseconds of each other. Um, so then that implies that the Nomad clusters, uh, the Nomad servers in a cluster, all need to be in the same physical data center. Now, in a lot of cloud providers, they've made it so they have groups of data centers close together geographically, and they've networked them together in a way, uh, in such a way that you can treat them as if they were one big data center. And the cloud providers refer to these as regions, and so Nomad refers to a single cluster as a region. 
lots of organizations want to deploy in more than one region at a time. Uh, maybe they want just want to have an equally fast user experience all around the world, or maybe they have EU customers who have strong privacy protections and need data sovereignty, or maybe they've, they've acquired other companies and now need to deploy onto multiple cloud providers. You might be able to get away with just having all your servers in one region and clients in another. Uh, the clients don't need to be that close to the servers. Uh, we have some users who deploy a nomad client node on distributed sites to support uh, IoT applications, let's say, and then they control them from a centralized set of servers. And that works fine. But if something in the region with those servers goes wrong, you've just lost control over everything, right? Your entire com control plane is now gone. So typically you'll deploy one nomad cluster to each region. The servers in one region aren't in the same raft group as servers in another region because they're too far apart, right? We wanted them, the servers needed to be 10 milliseconds apart and the speed of light is just too slow to do that. But this is okay because now if something goes wrong in one region, you don't need to worry about it cascading to other regions. This is called fault isolation. If you're an operator though, you don't wanna necessarily have to configure a secure connection and your ACLs to each and every region just to ask how it's doing. So we let you loosely join regions together with what we call federation. And federation lets you connect to one region with your command line client or with your web browser and have it forward your, your messages to another region. So if you're in London, you can say, hey, hey, I have this job to run in Tokyo and it will forward that job along to Tokyo to go get executed there. But federation doesn't join the regions in a raft, so you still don't need to worry about failures crossing regions, right? So if we have failures in, in say, two regions, they, it, only, uh, it only damages uh, communication with those regions and not the behavior of the other, uh, the other regions. This kind of federation has been in open source nomad since the very early versions. We've had that for a long time, uh, and that's in, the, in open source. But when you're running a lot of federated nomad, nomad regions, it's kind of hard to keep them in sync. Uh, if you have, if you want to run version two of your application and you want to run it in a subset of your regions, uh, you need to manually deploy to each one, or you need to write some kind of glue software to script that. And it gets even harder if you want to say, well, we want to deploy to one region first, make sure that's working, and then deploy to the rest. Um, and what happens if one of the regions fails during deployment? Um, what what should Nomad be doing in that case? How do, we, we'd have to you'd have to write that all that uh, all that logic as as an end user. And so those are the kinds of problems that users with large multi-region nomad deployments were bringing to us. And so that's why we built the new multi-region deployments feature in Nomad Enterprise 0.12. Uh, so you can now make a single job that's deployed to multiple regions. You have uh, configurable rollout and rollback strategies, and you can even template the job so that each region gets a different number of instances of, the, of that job. Now, we knew that when we designed multi-region uh, multi deployments that Nomad already had the right design for federation. We wanted to keep the clusters fault isolated and we wanted to be able to make really fast scheduling decisions. We didn't want to impact how Nomad worked for the single region use case. So we had to come up with a way to co coordinate across regions without changing our data model or making some kind of cluster of clusters. And we wanted to be able to do so without introducing the new operational overhead of some kind of external coordinator, uh, unlike the leading brand scheduler. So let's take a look at how that works. Okay. All right, so, sorry. On my left here, I've got, uh, I've got one region of servers and that is called the West. And on my right hand side here, I've got another uh, region of servers and that is called the East. So the first thing we need to do is we need to federate our cluster. So let's go nomad server join. And we're just going to grab one of the IPs of the other uh, cluster. And now if I were to look at the server members on either side, I see both, right? So that, that's, that's federation. Uh, that, that's all there is to that. Uh, and again, that's, that's currently in open source. Um, so let's take a look at the job that we wanted to deploy. So this is, uh, this is very similar to the example that you'll get if you run a uh, Nomad job in it, right? It's a Redis server. Uh, we have a health check uh, and we have an update block here, but the new block is this uh, multi-region uh, this multi-region stanza. And so what this says is that we, we're going to deploy to two regions, west and then east. And, th and they're in order here because that's the order that we're going to deploy them. Um, west is going to get uh, three instances of the, of the application and the east is going to get two instances. And we're going to deploy one region at a time because of this max parallel. If I said, uh, if I had, if I left this out or had it set to two, we would deploy to both of them simultaneously. 
Um, and if a region fails, we're only going to fail that region because it says, uh, oops, this says fail all. Actually, I wanted to say fail local. Um, we're only going to fail that region um, because of that fail local. If we if it said fail all, then we would actually fail the entire deployment and roll back the whole thing if it failed. So when you submit a multi-region job, the region that receives the request resubmits it to the other regions using Nomad's existing check and set tooling to make sure that everyone has the exact same version of the job that we expect. So let's go and look at our cluster here. I'm gonna set up a watch to look for the job status over on the west. And I'm gonna look, I'm gonna do the same on the east. And so on my left, I'm monitoring the region specific status of the west. And on my right, I'm monitoring the region specific status of the east. And of course, there's no job for that right now because I haven't run it yet. So we're, now we're gonna run that job. And what we should see here is that I have both uh, both deployments set up, but on the west, it's running um, and it's in a running state. And on the east, it's in a pending state. It's waiting for the peer region. So as each region finishes, it tells the next region that needs to go. And then it's going to wait in a block state. And so we should see in a few seconds here, uh, the west region will, will flip over to the block state and then we'll see the east is running. Um, we basically are just waiting for the health checks to complete. Yep, so now on the west, we see the deployment is complete and we're waiting for the peer region. And now that's running on the east. And we see we have two, two allocations running there and we see that the West is blocked here. And so we, we have the same view across both of them. And this should just take a few moments once both of, the, uh, both of them are healthy. Uh, once the, all regions are done, the last region in the list tells all the regions previous that were done and they're marked successful. Um, at any point, if any of the regions fails, uh, we look at that rollback strategy to see whether we need to fail all the regions or just let that one fail. Um, and so now at this point, we've seen that the deployment is complete and successful in both regions. So that's multi-region deployments. Uh, I definitely want to thank my colleagues, Mahmoud Ali, Chris Baker, and Drew Bailey on the Nomad team for really helping out a lot with this project. They contributed both code and a ton of great design feedback and helped to get this done. Um, we published a guide on multi-region deployment on learn.hashicorp.com that goes into more details, including some examples of what happens when jobs fail. So go ahead and download Nomad Enterprise 0.12 and take that first spin. Thanks all. And I'm going to hand it back to Eric. All right, let me uh, make sure I hit the mute button this time. <laughs> um, so thanks, Tim, for showing that. Now, while Tim was uh, showing us the, the multi-cluster uh, features, we actually see that the node eventually got lost and the job actually got rescheduled on a different node. Um, and to actually make sure that that is now actually correctly working, if we look inside the actual server, we now see that we actually do have that allocation running and we have the pause container as well, which gets spun up because of the bridge networking. So we have restored the state from our backup file and eventually everything got up running again and we have exactly the same state that we had before so if you would run this in maybe a cron job you could do backups um, occasionally and make sure that once you've reached a a state that you would like to stay in you could actually contain that now uh, we've gotten some questions through the chat um, and we will now move on to the Q&A section where we will be answering these. So let's uh, go through them. Do you want to go through them, Tim, or do you want me to uh, leave them? I don't know which yeah, one. Why don't you ask like them to... and I'll answer them if I can and we'll, we'll do that. That sounds good. All right. So the first question we got is from John Spencer, um, who's asking what tool we are using to spin up the cluster with that configuration. Um, now, I'm assuming that he means the tool we used in the, the demos. Um, so maybe I should answer that one since I was running those. Sure. Um, that tool is actually called Shipyard, and it's a little side project that uh, a few of our colleagues have created. And it's used for dev tooling and showing demos. It's just to quickly spin up a cluster, do some things, and then cleanly get rid of it. Um, so yeah, if you want to use that, we'll share the link 
afterwards? The, for, for what it's worth, the cluster that I stood up though was just uh, plain old Terraform and Packer because um, that helps. Yes. That, that works. That too. also works. <laughs> uh, let's see. So Jack O'Neill asks, no matter the size, you always have three to seven servers, uh, voting servers, right? I can always add non-voting servers to get performance uh, instead of having the three to seven servers on top of increasingly stronger metal. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and and granted, I was totally simplifying there. Yes, you can you can add non-voting servers to, to Raft. Um, the the Raft runs all the um, sorry, Raft runs all the uh, runs all rights through a leader, and so there will be a group of voting servers that elect that leader, and all the final decisions for scheduling are made on that leader. Um, the servers generally, though, uh, so so those those non-voting servers will get used for queries. Um, I I think uh, the scheduling itself, though, is only happening on the voting servers because they all need to be able to contribute rights back to the um, to the leader. Um, but I would have to double check on that. Uh, but but in general, like the the way that scheduling happens is that scheduling is done on workers on the non on the non-leaders. Um, although I think the leader runs a scheduler as well. Uh, and then those are all kind of like serialized together on the on that lead server. Uh, Schmeichel, uh, my colleague Schmeichel did a great deep dive on this recently, um, a couple of weeks back uh, where he goes into all the details about the scheduler and maybe Eric can share links about that later. Yes, cool. yes, it's on YouTube and we will definitely share it in the email following this. Awesome. Um, yeah, it, it's a nice uh, talk where he actually goes into all the hooks and all the decisions that get made. So definitely recommend that. Uh, next question um, is by Rob Madali. With the spread scheduler, there will typically be available resources on the client. Will the jobs be able to use this additional capacity if available? Um, and we ask some additional information. Um, basically, it's if my job doesn't use all the resources on a machine, will I still be able to place additional jobs on that machine. Now the spread scheduler doesn't actually change the behavior of Nomad of resource utilization. It's only in scheduling decisions. Maybe you want to add more to that, Tim? Sure. Um, so I, I think I think like one of the questions was that, or one kind of the clarifying bit here was that like, will a task be allowed to take more of the resources on the box if the box is lightly loaded? Um, or otherwise lightly loaded. Um, and, and the answer to that kind of depends on which of the resources that you're talking about and what task driver you're using. Um, so typically in the case of something like say a Docker container, um, although we schedule in megahertz, um, Linux, on Linux, it, the CPU slicing is done with something called a completely fair scheduler. And so that'll be CPU shares. And so in that case, you'll be getting, you will be scheduling on that, but you'll be having, you'll be, each task will be given a certain share of the CPU. And so that will kind of allow you some burstiness in terms of CPU. Um, memory is a little bit harder to deal with because you can't take away memory from a process that already has it without crashing it. Um, and so memory, uh, there are, Docker allows you to have soft memory limits, um, which we have, I think recently, I don't think it's a 0 0.12, but maybe in the 0 0.11 timeframe added uh, support for that Docker flag. I think it was 0 0.12 um, actually. Oh, okay. So that's okay. also in this release. Yeah, it was a very busy release. Um, and so that gives you a little bit more flexibility there in terms of, uh, of being able to scale memory uh, scale memory up for a running task. So I had a question about that one. Um, maybe other people are wondering that as well if they saw the release. So you can now schedule or, or specify soft limits and hard limit for uh, resources. Can you actually specify a soft limit higher than the hard limit? Or will it just enforce like your job will not be able to validate and run? Uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, that seems like the sort of thing that I mean, that seems like the whole point. Um, but I, I would have I, I wasn't really involved in in making that one, so I, I'd have to I'll have to defer that to uh, I can follow up later. Okay. So Bridget Gomhout, who I believe is a an old colleague of yours, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. is saying the multi-region deployments you were talking about are quite interesting. She's curious about some of the scaling changes uh, that we ran into when figuring this out. Is the speed of light a big factor? 
Uh, yeah, so so that's kind of um, that's kind of really what informed a lot of the design there, right? So there there's two there's two problems when you have multi when you're trying to deploy across clusters. There's there's uh, correctness, meaning like um, how do you make sure that the how do you get agreement between all the uh, all the bits, and then kind of um, availability, like how do you do how do you make that happen in a way that that is quick, um, and so so. Because each of the regions is like has its own state store and is making all the decisions uh, locally, we've really minimized the amount of communication that has to happen between each of the nodes. So once a node gets the uh, once a once a region rather um, gets its ver the new version of the job and is in that pending state, it actually doesn't do anything with that job. It 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 doesn't communicate out. It it just waits um, uh, and. It waits until the um, there's a there's a deadline timer, of course, but like but it but it doesn't do anything until it's contacted by the previous region that needs to know it. So so we've really kind of like scoped the amount of communication down to the handoff from one region to the next, and that's it. And then so it's a single RPC call um, between them. And so really, most of your delay in getting a multi-region deployment out is actually how long it takes for your task to become healthy. Um, so you know the the act of pulling down containers, waiting for them to be healthy. Um, Ends up being the by far the dominant factor of how how, how fast your deployment goes out. Okay, um, we have another somewhat mind twisting question that's quite interesting. Yash Kimani is asking: Could you have a nomad job, terraform the required infrastructure, and then also run the application on that infrastructure? So if you're terraforming some EC2 instances, for example. The expectation would be that the user data would configure a nomad client on those instances so that the instance joins and then you run a job on the instance that nomad just created. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you could totally do that. Um I, I've I've done that at, at, at now two different companies and, and that's actually how we run our nightly end-to-end -end tests. So we um we terraform a bunch of EC2 instances. They have some user data that configures them to, you know, pull down a particular version of Nomad, uh, you know, whatever the nightly the nightly build is, and then we execute a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, jobs on that. So, so we you basically have to like to run a, then to say like, oh, there's a subset of of, of jobs that you want to run. There's two ways that you could do that. Um, you could have a, a nomad job run just added into your uh, your user data, um, but more but more likely, what you're going to want to do because to do that to do that well, what you you need to do is have some kind of um, you'd have to have your ACL tokens and NTLS and everything set up uh, for that client, which you might not want to do. You might not want to have those keys on the client, um, and so. Uh, in a lot of cases, what you want to do if you're, you're trying to stand up, you know, you want to have a client come up and you want it to be running a particular set of jobs, uh, you'd run a system job, right? So you're saying like, uh, let's say it's your log shipper or it's your monitoring agents and you want to run those as nomad jobs. You'd run those as system jobs. And then when new clients get added, uh, the next uh, pass of the schedule, you know, the reconciler will say, hey, uh, I have new clients. Let's make sure that they have the system jobs. I, I think even with a normal service job, you could probably submit the job before the server even exists, have a constraint on that server that you're just creating. And then as soon as it would come up, it would cause a new evaluation and then get scheduled on there as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's in that blocking state, um, I, there, there's a, I think there's a, there's a time to live on those. So they won't yes. live forever, <laughs> but, but, you, but yes, yeah, that'll work. Yeah, um, and I think a more elegant way now would probably be using the auto scaler uh, to give you that capacity. Um, so the new AWS um, auto scaler that can actually add instances for you and then schedule no ad jobs on that. Absolutely. Uh, when needed. Yeah. Um, I'm double checking the chat to see if there is something else. Okay. Um, so. Florian asks, for our services, we don't auto promote. We run smoke tests before manually promoting from Jenkins and moving on to a new region. Is there a way to define a job with multi-region deployment and also have promoting after smokes have passed? Um, yes, with an asterisk. So, so you can, um, if you use the so, so in the job that we, uh, in the demo that I had, I said max parallel one, right? So we say, we're only gonna run the first job. We're only gonna run that first, uh, we're gonna run one region at a time. 
if you use the existing Canary uh, setup, so the, the existing, there's an update stanza that allows you to have the auto promote and, and uh, Canary uh, deployments that you, you would normally have in a single region deployment, you can set up that first region so that it does that. And then just not pass that region if it, um, if, if it doesn't, you know, if you can say like fail all in the, in the multi-region uh, deployment so that um, when that first region, if it fails to, uh, to, to meet its health checks and meet whatever, you know, you're, you're doing to make sure that it's valid, um, the deployment won't continue to the other regions. Uh, in, so that's kind of like what you can do now. Um, in future work, what we'd really like to do is to be able to say, um, to have like, the ability to promote across regions one by one and to be able to have like manual operator inter intervention to say, hey, um, we wanna do a bunch of manual testing of this before we promote it. Um, and that's definitely a um, something that's on, it, it's, we don't have a, a, you know, a timeline for it, but it's definitely something we've been talking about with, with folks who've, uh, who've had an early chance to look at this. Nice. Checking the chat again. I think we've had most of the questions. I don't know if Ed had any additional ones from YouTube. Wait for the man behind the curtain too. Nope, I think we, we answered all the YouTube ones too. We're all good there too. Okay. Well, I hope this was informative for everybody. Um, thank you, Tim, for showing us that awesome demo. Thanks for um, having me. And we hope to see you next time for the next webinar. And we will send out links uh, with all the information that we mentioned here during this uh, webinar. Thank you all.